You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Two, one. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have a a really special guest. This guy uh, broke the internet. He had, I think, over 2,000 downloads for his uh, first episode when he was on the show. People loved him. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, You have a guide service. I want to get into that. We're going to be talking about the Shenandoah River. I mean, let's just get started with it. You're going to start a guiding service. It's Brothers Fishing Service. How did all this start? Well, it, it's uh it started uh i i've done some guiding you know years ago and then you know i talked to jason ford who's the captain of the strasburg pd and uh, he wanted to get into it too so you know again i was a uh, i'm a retired police officer he was a police officer so you know we think of ourselves as brothers so there came the name as brothers fishing service and, you know, w- when I talked to Jason, you know, my whole thing was I want to, I want to cater to people that have not, that don't have a lot of experience, you know, uh, maybe they want to take their, their son or daughter, a father or a mother, you know, uh, we want to cater to those type of people or, or even people that, that love to fish, but don't know a lot about it. You don't want to learn different techniques and stuff. That's the type of people we want to take out and, uh, you know, show them, show them, you know, new techniques, how to catch them and, and you know, what to look for and all and stuff like that. And plus they make memories, you know? No, a hundred percent. And you guys have so much knowledge. Um, you know, shout out to, to Jason, have had him on the show before. We'd love to have him back on again. And that's really why I wanted to start this, this, this show was to kind of highlight so many of the local sticks that know these right. places better than anyone else. And, and it's not to bash a pro. It's not that, but a guy that's lived and grown up on a fishery is going to have so much more historical knowledge of that fishery than a guy that shows up for three or four weeks. Right. In general. And, and then that, mm-hmm. that's so much fun because it's example of the Shenandoah river guys, we were just talking um, off air that the Shenandoah river had a big kayak tournament and you got to pick between the Potomac, between the Shenandoah and the Rappahannock. And what's interesting to me is in years past, that tournament was always one of the Rappahannock. It was one out of the Shenandoah. People are choosing to fish the Shenandoah in a tournament because they know they can win there, which is insane when you think of the history and how much heartache this place has had that people are saying, like, I think I can win a tournament on the Shenandoah. So that's pretty cool. Absolutely. You know, uh, the thing about the Shenandoah River that a lot of people don't realize, I mean, even though it's not not as big as the Susquehanna, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's got, there's, there's some decent fishing. It gets a lot of pressure, but you, you, there are spots that you can do in like a John boat or a kayak. If you really do your research, you can find all these like hidden spots where you can actually, you know, put a boat in like a kayak or a John boat and you can fish some water that doesn't get the pressure. And there's, there's still some quality smallmouth. In, in the north and south port. And when we talk about the guide service, to bring it back to that, um, what would people that would like to go out with you to fish on the Shenandoah, uh, what are you using? Are you using a, a jet boat, a raft? I I, I actually have a Express H18. Uh, I can take two people at a time. Jason has a RT-188P Ranger. Uh, they're both aluminum. And, you know, he could take two people as well. So, you know, we could do parties of four uh, and take both boats. Or, you know, if it's just a party of two, him or I could take you out. And, and you know, we, we could go to different spots. There's the town of Shenandoah. We could fish Egypt Bend. We could fish Riverton. Uh, but, you know, we also could do Anna and the Potomac as well. I mean, that's, that's you know, a little more expensive when you start making long runs. But local. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot cheaper and plus for somebody that, that, you know, has not done a lot of fishing, uh, that's, that's good to go local and and learn and, and, you know, you're still going to catch fish. No, absolutely. And that's, what's so fun about this area, um, in Northern Virginia, that's 
constantly getting bigger. You have Western Loudon that really bunches straight up to the main stem oh, yeah. of Shenandoah. And then Winchester is growing too. And the fact is that you can go and catch nice smallmouth and get a guided fishing trip so close to home. You don't have to go yes. to the Upper James or the New River places like that. Susquehanna, for example. Right. Yeah, um, it's, it's proven. Oh, it a hundred percent is proven now. So with, with the, um, with that boat and let's just talk into it right now, what is the flow rate right now? We're talking mid June right now. What is the flow rates that you're seeing? Okay. Uh, as far as the North, the North forks really, really, you know, it, it at, uh, Riverton, I think it's point, uh, it's 1.84 or something like that. But, you know, again, the two rivers are totally different as far as level wise. Uh, the South Fork, which is uh, 1.19, I think. As far as a jet boat, they're they're pretty limited now because now it's gotten to the point where any of those ledges that the water was just, you know, just running over maybe a, a, a half a foot to a foot, now they're exposed. So a lot of these jet boats, you know, they can't, they can't run the river. They can put in in certain spots and run short distance, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like the boats that Jason and I have, we have to put in in deeper water. So they're not really jets or they're outboard, uh, prop motors. So, you know, uh, my buddy has uh, a friend of mine, he has a, uh, river rocket and, uh, it's, it's brand new. I think it's like maybe a year or two old. That thing is awesome I it's nice it's got the new uh bottom on it that uh special aluminum i think it's 70 75 or something like that oh wow but that that thing we've had it at one 1 1.39 we were able to run in that jet boat uh and you know again when when you start getting down that levels it's almost you just have to float it like in a kayak or, or a john boat and you're still going to end up getting out in spots. That's still, that's insane though. And like, I mean, those boats are cool. And I'm not saying like, if you wouldn't, hey, if anyone's watching that wants to gift me one, I'll take it. But it's like, good Lord, those things are expensive. <laughs> I think uh, with, with everything, like, you know, of course, if you do like all the grass and stuff like that, you're looking at about 70 some thousand bucks. That's, yeah. that's a, that's a pretty good clip of money. It, it, it really is. And then you think about the fuel consumption, like how much yep. does that take? And then I, granted, depending on your strategy, I guess you wouldn't have to be running too much of the river right now, but um, like really getting into the river side of things as we're getting in from this, from this post spawn into the summertime, what are you seeing on the Shenandoah right now? Just in general, to begin I with. just, uh, I just fished a tournament. Uh, Jason, and I fished a tournament last Saturday at Riverton. You know, and I think, you know, for smallmouth, most of the smallmouth are done. They're, they're, they're running into, uh, what you're looking at is like fry garters and uh, post spawn fish. But, you know, at Riverton, I noticed a ton of largemouth still on beds, which really? was real. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I was actually fishing for them until it got muddy, but. It got muddied up by a jet, by a jet ski boat. But anyhow, I, I noticed quite a bit of largemouth on beds down Riverton. But, you know, I, I understand that from what some people say that they spawn more than one time. I don't know. Uh, it's possible, I guess. But I, I think the spawn is kind of late this year. It seems to me. Yeah, it would be interesting to get more kind of people's thoughts on that too, because you're not the only person to say that where it's like, it seems like it's a little different this year than in years past. And I, and I don't know, it's just, to me, it's felt a lot cooler than, than. Yeah, others. yeah, it, it has been actually, but you know, I've always read that when they're ready to go on beds, if, if they got to go, they got to go temperature won't make a difference, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, again, we all know that not all of them spawn at the same time. So, uh, I, I know that the large mouth spawn later than the small mouth. So, you know, that tells me with what I'm seeing that, uh, the large mouth are doing their thing. Now they're spawning. Now, uh, small mouths are probably for the most part done. Uh, and again, here in the next couple of weeks, the top water is really going to start taking off because now you're going to have fry garters. 
in largemouth and smallmouth, and you're going to have, you know, post-spawn fish. So uh, a lot of those fish are going to be munching pretty good here in the next few weeks. How hard is it to catch these smallmouth when they're in that post-spawn funk on the river? You know, it uh, it always seems like there's a, uh, uh, like a downtime, like a lull from from the time they spawn until they they you know they get their energy back and start eating again uh you know for the most part the smallmouth i i would think like a week or two you know they they got to rest up and then they start eating just munching and I, you know here about two weeks ago uh the buddy that's got the river rock we got on the river and uh we went in the evening and there was a large mayfly hatch coming off and I mean to tell you, we downsized to these small mega, uh, mega bass makes these real tiny pop bars that, uh, they may be two and a half inches, but they, they got uh, the rattles in them and they, they're weighted to where you can sling them long ways with a spinning rod. They were crushing them. They were absolutely crushing them. And I don't know if it had to do with the mayfly because they were just, you could see them sipping spinners off the top coming out of the water. It was, uh. It was a good day. That's so freaking cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know what? Mega bass popper. I'm actually gonna look that up right now. But yeah, like it's matching the hatch is so important. And and even when they're eating those bugs and stuff, it doesn't have to yes. look like a fly necessarily. No, you get the action. No. It just needs to be the same size. Right. Exactly. You know, a lot of people get confused when they, you know, they, they see them hitting top water and they they can't get them to bite. You know, a lot of that is is and I've talked about this before when they look up, you know, they, they see, you know, just, just like an outline. And, you know, if you're fishing a bigger bait, uh, you're going to get bit. But if you, you know, again, the, this, when you got mayfly and they were pretty good size mayflies, you got them coming off like that. If you can downsize smaller, you'd be surprised at how much more, uh, bites you're going to pick up that way. Hmm. That's really neat. I didn't even think yeah, about it. You know, one thing I noticed is, you know, you always say big baits, big fish, but that's not always true. You know, I, I've, I've caught some huge bass on small baits. Yeah, especially when they're like, when they are completely keyed into it. And I think that's the hardest thing is to know when to commit to that big bait, big fish versus trying to match the hatch. And, and you know, I think, I think, wisdom says you know when you have highly pressured situations or the forage is abundantly clear that it's of that yeah. smaller variety uh, I, I believe is generally when you when you do that um yeah i mean and that's the thing is like i think it's so interesting the way river smallmouth and lake smallmouth they're so different they're completely different they could be oh, different yeah. from each other and i think a lot of people don't understand that 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 don't have the opportunity to try to fish for them in two different areas of the country whether it's a, a deep lake like let's say clater lakes smith mountain or the shenandoah river completely am different animals yeah i can tell you from experience uh you could fish the shenandoah river for smallmouth and go to smith mountain lake and be totally done you would i mean you know it it's you're right you're absolutely right it's different they i don't know you know they still feed on you know basically the same kind of forage but it, it's harder to catch them at Smith Mountain Lake than it is on, on you know, like the Shandor River. Lake fish, they're different. And then, and then, guys, for the people that, that aren't want, uh, that that are not completely familiar with the Shenandoah, when we mention Riverton, if you go to Front Royal Riverton, there's a there's a dam actually on the main stem of the river that backs up all the way to the fork or the split where the river goes from the north and the south fork converge into the main stem and so there's a big dam there that makes like a little bit of a of a lakeish thing or just it backs up the river i guess you have the same thing really on the upper potomac where i live where you have at williamsport you have dam dam four dam five um and then and you were talking about this tournament that went down like kind of talk about that a little bit like what happened in that event so you know uh it was just a club tournament and jason and i uh, decided to fish it and uh of course uh, Jason uh, actually took a customer out the week before down there, and he he showed me a video that he took of a largemouth on beds. So you know we went to that spot first, and uh, of course it you know when they when they spawn it only lasts a few days, 
and you know then they go into their next phase but uh they what if the bass wasn't there so we got to we started out early that morning we don't it was only a six hour tournament so mm -hmm. you know and i knew that our bite window was going to be like in the first hour after that you know on a saturday the boat traffic and stuff it was going to go away and uh we uh we actually caught our all, 90 percent of our fishing you know in that first hour we caught them on top water using the walking baits and uh that bite went away and then of course i started seeing them on beds and i started fishing those but then that got muddied up by other boats and uh we ended up getting second place but uh there, you know, we saw some cruising bass. I seen this one I know had to be five or six pounds just cruising. Wow. So, and, and she looked, she looked like she was post spawn, uh, but she just wouldn't eat, you know, just cruising. I think, you know, they get in that mode where right after they get done spawning, they don't want, they don't want to eat right away. They're just mm -hmm. trying to recover. And I, I think that's basically what she was doing. She wasn't moving fast, just kind of being lazy that is that's amazing because if it's like four to five pounds and even let's be conservative and say it's like you know three and a half four yeah if it was pre-spawn you're talking every bit of six plus oh yeah that thing if that thing you could tell it was skinny yeah and if that thing uh would have been uh pre-spawn holy smokes yeah it probably would have been six i would say you know just from what i could see of it it was every bit four and a half five maybe close to six i don't know it was pretty big but it's hard to judge in the water you know uh but if that thing had been pre-spawn oh yeah definitely you mentioned something very interesting where you talked about the boat traffic and i think this is really important because you know where i live um on the potomac you have big slack things like no. that which is kind of like riverton and in the summertime everybody yeah. and their brother goes there and this thing guys you could throw a baseball across it easily, even if you couldn't throw very much. It's not super wide. So right. the traffic is a major issue there. Do can you is there a do the fish just shut down completely when you have that amount of traffic or are they still catchable? Or is it in your mind, I got four hours to catch them here and then I gotta move? Uh, you know, again, when you when you listen to the pros talk, they talk about bite windows. You know, they they might be on some fish and they're not biting, but they'll come back to them. And it's the same in the river. I, you know, again, the boat traffic kind of affects them, you know, to some extent. So I would you normally fish a little deeper. Uh, if there wasn't the boat traffic, I'd probably be anywhere from the bank to, you know, eight feet of water. But when the boat traffic really gets heavy, if I got depth, you know, like 10, 15 feet, I'll go to that because it, it, you know, they don't get affected as much, but like any, like in a small waterway like that, anytime you got boat traffic, anything that's close to the bank gets affected, it's going to, they're going to push off from it. So, uh, that's when I'll start going deeper and I'll try to get to where most of the boat traffic doesn't come to, mm -hmm. you know, there's, it's just like when you fish a lake, no wake zone. You want to fish the no wake zones because even though you got boat traffic, it's not, they're not real heavy pushing water, you know? So I will, you always fish, like you try to find the places that the boats aren't as heavy. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense actually. And, and then, and then really with Riverington in mind, you have the North Fork and the South Fork. And then just trying to explain for people at home this time of year, um, is the North Fork and the South Fork generically, is it basically the same thing? Or are they two unique fisheries? So so the South Fork is basically about 150 miles. And then the North Fork, I think, is like 90. So, you know, both of them have the same properties. But in the North Fork, you don't, if you, you don't have as many dams very few dams. So the North Fork is not very wide at all. It, it And it's still composed of ledges uh, and like sandstone rock, the round rock, you know, and, and same as the South Fork, but the South Fork is a lot wider and it has more dams. And so, so it has deeper water. And you, you know, the one thing I noticed about the North Fork, there's very few places that there's any mud bottom. 
it's just mostly all rock. And and the reason I think that is, is because it's so narrow. When it does flood, it pushes most of that mud all the way down. Now there, uh, there's a dam in Woodstock. There's two dams in Woodstock actually. And uh, now those you'll find a little bit of mud on the bottom, you know, around close to the dam. But for the most part, the, the North Fork is mainly all rock and ledges. Where the South Fork, you have a lot more mud on the bottom in certain areas. And uh, current wise, uh, the North Fork should be more current than the South Fork because South Fork has it below the dams and, and uh, throughout the river, where the North Fork is mainly the straight shot. And then the North Fork is going to be a little bit more shallower, more you float it. Yes. Is it not as jet boat uh, capable? <clears throat> there's there's a couple of places that I've seen them put jet boats in, you know, and run. Uh, but still, it in order to run a jet boat on North Fork, it has to be at least 2.5, maybe 2.5 or 3. Uh, whereas at South Fork, you could, you can run a jet boat at probably 1.9 to two and, uh, cover a lot of water. You could, if you like my buddy's jet boat, uh, we put in that new ramp down below, uh, Morgan's Ford. And I think we had 1.9 and we ran from that new ramp all the way to the Riverton Dam. Wow. And that jet boat, yes, and never touched. That's insane. Yeah, that, that was amazing. You know, uh it, it if you look at the bottom in a jet boat while you're running, you'll never you'll never run it because it just scares you to death. It, it, it'll pucker you up real quick. It, <laughs> it, it really freaking well. <laughs> and ah, but man, that's that's so freaking cool. Cause yeah, like if you're not it's so when you talk about knowledge, local knowledge. That is so important when it comes to rivers and running rivers, more so than any, like just from a safety aspect that. Oh, absolutely. If, yes. if, if you just move to like Northern Virginia, cause you got a job in DC and you're going to go run a boat in the Shenandoah, you know, you can look on a map and you would still be in trouble unless you had that local knowledge of like this section, these times of years, you can run these sections. It's just, you're going to just destroy your boat doing right. it. Right. But there's, there's lay downs that come in, you know, we have floods all the time there's lay downs that get put in that you know people don't realize there's some that may be there for years and there's some that'll move in and then move out because of the flooding and you know the one thing i've always said you know if we had a massive flood in the river the first thing i do when i put in is just coast just just actually just idle around looking for them hmm. and then that way when i run it i know where they're at so as this water level really starts to to come down as we get into like more of our summer flow, what do the smallmouth do typically? How do they set up on the so, so what's going to happen is once this water gets down, you know, like where it is now, these these smallmouth move into pockets. So like if you're fishing a kayak or a john boat uh, in shallow, uh, like the North Fork, for instance, what you're going to want to do you're going you're going to find them in pockets. If you if like and both rivers they'll have stretches where it's just like small small round chunk rock you know uh nothing just a flat bottom with rock those smallmouth they won't they won't get in that they, huh. they they may cruise through it but they won't stay in that they'll move to like little pockets little holes uh uh we always talk about the the eddies the backwashers They'll move into those pockets and just stay there. They'll they'll stay there until that water rises and they'll move around, you know. But for the most most all that I ever see is they'll get behind ledges and stuff like your faster water and little pockets. Oh wow. Uh it could be anywhere from two to four feet, five feet. But if you you know, any any stretches you got where it's just like small pea gravel or or just small rock. I don't, it, it's, and the, my thinking of this is because the bigger rocks hold the crawfish and the smaller chunk rock, the crawfish don't get around much. They always get around the bigger rocks. So, and I, I think that's why they, they stay in those pockets like that. Does, does the whole river have this same distribution of crayfish and minnows? Or are there certain areas that just tend to have more of them? You know, for the most part, like like with the minnows, they 
And, and I think this is another reason why the bass go in these pockets because the minnows do the same thing. The minnows, uh, they're just sporadic out through the river. Now, if you fish like where the dams are above the dams and stuff, of course, they're going to have a lot more uh, minnows and forage and stuff. But, but the minnows are just, they want to get out of the current. So they'll get around like lay downs in the river. Say, uh, for instance, if you got if you're fishing North Fork in, in a kayak, and you see a lay down in the middle of the river, I can guarantee you 100 percent there's going to be smallmouth on it. There's going to be minnows on it, guaranteed, because it it it's it's uh, obstructing the flow of current, which makes it easier for them to to swim in it. You know, uh, it could be a big rock. Uh, you know, something like that, that will keep them close. You know, they'll stay close to that. It's just like any other fish, you know, they, they like uh, structure or cover. Yeah, that that's so interesting because people really fail to, to think that like on a river, let's say, you know, the north or the south fork, that is a little bit more narrow than like the Susquehanna, how much the smallmouth actually move around. And, and to me, this is the probably the best time of year for somebody to go fish the river because the smallmouth are distributed throughout yes so, and when you stereotypically think fast moving water riffles this is when you can catch them compared to winter time where having a jet boat is so is so nice where you can just really quickly jump from hole to hole to hole where they stack up right yeah exactly you know and, and like when you fish the north fork or the south fork when you when you're in a, a like a john boat or, or a kayak you know i there many many years i floated both rivers and you you would fish sections and you think god I, you know i'm not getting a bite I'm, I, I haven't got bit there ever and then i finally realized that there was nothing there to actually hold these fish mm -hmm. and then you would come to a set of rapids and then next thing you know, you get on the other side of them, you start hammering them. And, and I think a lot of it is there, it, it, it obstructs the, the current flow and plus it's bringing food to them. They don't have to do nothing to sit there, just like a trout, you know, they sit there and wait on it to come to them. And then, you know, if there's nothing happening, they cruise, you know, they, they cruise looking, they're always looking to eat just like anything else how this time of year compared to other times of year how finicky are the smallmouth to your presence um I, I feel like at certain times of the year you almost have to be very stealthy on how you approach the juice to make your cast versus other times of the year i feel like they just don't care at all well and you know like like this this post spawn you know when they get to a certain point they gotta eat and they're hungry i think they let their guard down a lot mm -hmm. uh that and the fry garters, you know, of course they're guarding the fry and, and you know, they, they hit anything that gets close to them. I think that's a lot of it. Now, when in the winter time, when you fish for them, obviously they go deeper and, you know, they're just kind of being lazy and they'll pick up something that comes along. But like in the dead of summer, I think, you know, the best times are like, in the morning or in the evening when they when they feed like i said there's like three windows you got one in the morning one in the afternoon and one in the late evening but you, again i think this like i said this time of year about right now they're going to start eating because you got a lot of post spawn fish that's recovering and they want to eat so you know i think you got a better chance of catching them now catching them off guard because the later in the summer it gets, the more they suspend and the more they pay attention, uh, like when it's really, really clear water. And, they can, and, you know, you make noise in a boat or something like that, you spook them. They're pretty easily spooked. How, and this has been a fun conversation I've had on a couple of episodes recently that uh, while we haven't dropped yet while recording this, but about the full moon and new moon. Some people swear by it. Some people don't. Do you have an opinion on that at all? Like how the full well, moon you know, I, I think that it, it, you know, fish don't have eyelids, obviously. So, you know, they don't, they don't like the sun, but they also, they feed by vibration too. So, you know, I think a full moon does, does it make a difference? I mean, it, uh, again, it may put a little more light on the river. But, you know, it's all about silhouette. 
and vibration. Uh, you know, why do you use black spinner baits at nighttime? Yeah, the silhouette. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. You know, it's 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 all about vibration and silhouette. I I, I you know, the the full moon. I don't know if it makes that much difference. It's possible, I guess. That's yeah. my take on it. I wonder how much of it affects. And so the theory I've heard, and take this where the grain of salt, guys, I'm not a professional, is the fish will feed later into the night. And that's why the morning bite sometimes is not as good on a full moon. The other thing I've heard is it affects the crayfish. The crayfish movement is different during the moon phases. And the wives tale I was taught as a kid is you always fish a jig around a full moon because that's when the jig bite will be better. I don't I mean, know, if that's true you know or not, but it's, I'll it's tell you, when, I, when I was a police officer, I would go, we, uh, there in Strasburg, we had a, we got a boat ramp, North Fork, and I would go down there at nighttime and I would look at that ramp and at nighttime, them crawfish were everywhere. Really? You know? Oh yeah. Everywhere. But as soon as that daylight came up, they were gone. Hmm. So, you know, again, crawfish come out at nighttime. So that's another reason, you know, that full moon, I don't know how much difference that makes, but I know that crawfish move a lot at nighttime and, and you know, that they're going to feed on them. That makes, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Did you, and it just really gets down to your bait presentations. And I guess, you know, we, we can't have you on the show without asking you these questions. What, what are your three baits to be throwing? Not to catch necessarily the biggest, but just to have success this time of year on the Shenandoah River. Well, you know, the one thing I've noticed is this time of year, all that pollen and stuff starts sinking and floating, and it causes uh, like a scum on the bottom, like a slime. So it's hard to fish uh, like a, a jig or something this time of year. You can, uh, if you don't mind taking that deposit off from it all the time. But the biggest thing, I like, you know, one, one bait that I use this time of year, a lot of people don't use on rivers, a swim jig. And I can tell you straight up right now, that swim jig will, will hammer some fish. Uh, and, and I always use the perch collar. It, uh, I, you know, again, the, the bluegill are spawning now. Then them bass are eating. They're going to eat. You know, I, I target the bluegill beds if I can find them. Uh, and then I use like a swim jig. Uh, as far as top water goes, I mean, I may use like a walk bait or a pop bar, but or a frog. I don't, I don't get too wild with that. But uh, plastic wise, I like to, I like to use like uh, the dead heads. They work really, really good. Uh, especially, you know, if the water's pressured, smaller baits work good. Uh, but I'll use, I'll throw a net head with. Uh, like the TRDs or, or the, the little, uh, zoom, uh, not zoom, but the, uh, Z man crawl, them little ones. Oh, yeah. They work really, really well. And then, you know, uh, again, I do, if, if I'm in like uh, deep water, I'll flip a lot like tubes and stuff like that. Tubes work really well. So the net heads, tubes, crank baits work fairly good but again you know you got to deal with all the the slime and stuff on the bottom so uh i'll stick to net heads tubes and uh swim jig basically what what weight and this would just be a, a broader topic compared to the winter time versus now are you using the same weighted head or are you adjusting that based on the volume of water in the river my all my uh dead heads and jigs and stuff like that I, it's all based on you know like water flow if, if i got a lot of current i'll go a little heavier but i try to you know to me I, I try to use as light as i can get away with you know i still want to make contact with the bottom and feel it uh but also you know fish bass are just like trout uh if, if you're throwing something and it's moving along the bottom you know not on the bottom, but uh, uh, off the bottom, you want it to flow the same speed as the current. You don't, you, if it goes faster, yeah, it kind of looks unnatural, you know, especially if it's like a crawfish or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but again, I adjust my weight according, and, and you know, jig wise, if, if I'm the, uh, I'll fish a bigger jig in the, in the winter than I will in the summer. In the summer, I downsize. 
And I don't know. Uh, it seems to me that the, the, the smallmouth, they like a, they really eat smaller crawfish than the bigger ones. Now, they'll eat the bigger ones, but the smaller crawfish, man, they just tear them up. It's and a I don't lot know, different to deal with, probably. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know the, the, the reasoning behind it, but I know that they will take smaller crawl patterns in the summertime versus a, a larger one. That's an, that's so cool, yeah. guys, and, and that is the juice right there on that tip. Um, last thing would be like topwater baits. Like, what, what are your topwater bait sections? Is it just that popper? If, or? if I'm fishing smallmouth, I won't throw a frog. Uh, I, I've caught smallmouth on a frog, but, hmm. but. Not as many. Uh, usually the smallmouth, I'll throw like a popar or like a Zara spook, something, or, you know, just like a, or a gunfish 95. Uh, that, for all you folks, is a Lucky Craft uh, walking bait that's got just a little mouth pop to it. So it, it walks and it's got a little pop to it. And uh, I'll definitely use a gunfish 95 and a Zara spook and a popar. I won't, you know, that'll catch pretty much any large mouth or small mouth. And I base my colors like, you know, if it's like blue bird skies, I like to use, and the water's fairly clear, I'll use a clear translucent color. You know, just something that's clear, maybe have a little flash. Uh, but, you know, like if it's overcast or something like that, I'll throw black or a dark color. That's really, really cool. Cause yeah, like I, I never even thought of that about, about using a spook for river smallmouth. I've used it for lake smallmouth, uh, a ton Champlain places, Smith mountain lake places like that. But I never thought about using it there on a river system. I'll so, tell you many, many years ago, uh, storm made a bait and they still make it. I don't know if storm still makes it, but it's called a chug bug. I don't know if you've ever seen one. It kind of looks like a gunfish. Hmm. Uh, but I was using that chug bug and I absolutely wore it out on smallmouth. They actually had a hole in it. They, it, they hit it so much. It, it just wore it out. It started sinking. And, you know, uh, is there a spook, a chrome? All you need is like a chrome, uh, and, uh, a clear one and, and to get a, like a dark color. That's all you need. Is there a spook will absolutely crush smallmouth. You learn to walk the dog, yeah, it's on. What do you throw that on usually? Are you throwing straight braid or are you throwing mono? I yeah, I always throw uh, straight braid, but I will. Uh, it depends. A lot of times I'll put like a uh, a foot liter of mono in front of it because one thing braid does, like with walking baits or pop bars, it it's really light, so it'll catch the front hook, and you're always trying to get it off that front hook but if you put like a foot or two of monofilament onto that braid it won't do that and the monofilament floats so it keeps it high in the water you get a better action that way that's a great idea i never even thought about using a mirror like that for that that's actually brilliant yeah <laughs> you do that all the time yeah you actually tie all you need is like a foot or two foot liter and uh of monofilament and just tie it to the braid just like you would uh like a uni knot, you know, and then uh, just tie it to your top water. It won't, it won't do that anymore. And plus, it, it gives it better action because the braid tends to pull the t the front down some, so you don't get as good as action. Whereas the monofilament sits high in the water, so you'll get a better action on your monofilament. That makes so much sense. And it gives you a little bit of stretch. That is the absolute juice. That is so yeah. freaking cool. That's guaranteed uh, money. What are the, uh, we talked about the, the mad Tom situation. Mad Tom's are guys. If you didn't know, you can go back and look at the original episode, but they're basically baby. They're little catfish yes. that do make up a big portion of their diet. How important are they in the summertime or are they more important in like the winter or spring? I think, you know, the mad Tom's they, they work really well in, in the, in the summer. Uh, I, you know, again, like you said, they're, they're just like small baby catfish and, and they'll work year round, you know, that, that color, and the, you know, they, it's just one of their forages that, that they feed on, you know, when they get the opportunity and the catfish, 
you know, remember, I remember one of your episodes where he's talking about the catfish in Susquehanna. Well, you know, the North Fork and the South Fork is getting the same way now. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. 20 years ago, you wouldn't, you wouldn't catch uh, a catfish on bass baits, 2025. If you did, it was, it was, you know, not very often. Now, you catch you catch catfish all the time because there's so many of them. Uh, we we ran up to the dam there on the North Fork, up to that I guess it's Middletown Dam, and that jet boat. And we sat there. The water was just a little bit muddy, and he has live scope, so we was fishing the live scope, and we could see him. And it was just littered with catfish, just everywhere. And Riverton, you go down Riverton wintertime. And you see a school catfish, it has to be a, a at least a thousand. Just a wow. big black cloud. I've never wow. seen anything like that. And it's gotten worse. So they're taking a lot of porridge. Those catfish got to eat. Yeah. Why do you think there's so many catfish in the river system right now? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know whether, you know, they just, people are not taking them. Well, one thing, you know, the South and North Fork, they, they tell you not to eat but so much fish, you know, mm-hmm. per year because of the mercury. But uh, I think, you know, a lot of people, they don't take them and uh, they, they multiply, you know, it's just a ton of catfish. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I wonder like how much like the water temp situation where you have warmer water, so it's more feasible for them. Plus, you know, ever since that fish kill, has that affected it at all? Has that changed things up? I mean, I, I don't know. I, you know, again, I don't, you would think that there has to be enough forage to sustain that many, but I don't know. Uh, they, you know, catfish will eat anything. Uh, so they're competing with smallmouth. Now, I don't know how much it'll affect. I know like that Riverton Dam, as many catfish is in there, it's pushing the smallmouth They're, like it did in Susquehanna. They'll start moving to other places, other pockets, you know. Well, the pockets they used to, to catch them in, you know, deeper pockets, they won't be there because the catfish are overtaking it. Hmm. And it's going to be just like Susquehanna. They'll move around. Do I think they will... Decrease in population in smallmouth? Uh, I don't think so. But, you know, that many catfish, eventually, you know, the the, the, the forage, that, that's a lot of catfish to be. That's a lot of catfish. And I don't know. I, th- I think I really hope that it creates some kind of homeostasis where you find some kind of balance. Um, you know, Susquehanna is unique because it's so big. It's a massive, yes. massive yes. fishery. And so... You, and so how would the Shenandoah be affected when it's not that big? I don't know. That's what bothers me. Cause I, I don't know what it's going to do, but when, when you can throw a bass bait and the catfish is eating that, you know, that tells me that they're out to eat anything they can get. So they're competing. Uh, and you know, there's only so much forage in the river. And it's like you said, it's not that big. No, it's not. And if you're talking about, let's say, the flathead situation, like that is a carnivorous animal. That thing it wants to hunt. It doesn't usually want to just sit and scavenge on the bottom. Other catfish species, I, you know, and I would defer to people with better better knowledge on this subject than me. But from my knowledge base, you know, other catfish species aren't as aggressive. They are more bottom feeders. You channel catfish, but there are species that are more predatory and hunt. Right. Right. Yes, there is. Uh, the, what I see in the North and South for mostly are, cha- they're all channel cat, you know, but, uh, thank goodness. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. if yeah, they get the whole not... flathead situation, that would be, oh, that yeah, would... I don't even want to think about that. Do you, and honestly, that's where I feel like there's a godsend with the, the Millville dam by Harper's Ferry and then Riverton is I wonder if that will help stop the, the push up of the flathead because flathead are are really locked in on the upper Potomac, even in the main stem of the upper Potomac. And it doesn't sound like, at least from what I hear, there's not a lot of flathead, if any, on the main stem of the Shenandoah. Right no, now. I, I think, you know, those dams will, will prevent it. I, they make a big difference, you know, cause uh, they're not going to run up that, but uh, I think it will, it will help. I mean, there's a few here and there, but there's not that many. It's most, I'd say 90% just channel cap. Now, there is another species on the river that's making a big commotion, I think in a positive way. The DWR has done a really good job stocking walleye. Oh, yeah. And 
I thought it was like, okay, it's a niche little unicorn. You might catch it now and then. And then I went out with Travis over the winter time and we stuck a couple. And then I see photos all over the place. Like, has the walleye population really just taken off? Yes. Yes. You know, uh, many, many years ago, you didn't, if you caught a walleye, it was like uh, uh, a unicorn announcement, a national announcement, you know. Yeah. Now they're common. And, uh, you know, I've caught a few myself and, and, they're good eating, but, but yeah, I think, uh, I don't think they're going to hurt the system at all. I think they, you know, they're pretty, uh, they're good fish too. I like to fish for them, but I don't, uh, I, they must be reproducing because I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot, actually a lot of them in the river in, in the South Fork, especially in the deeper pools. There's, there's a lot of them on the main stem too, below Riverton as well. And I really want to do a, a walleye centric episode at some point just to talk about them because they're no longer like niche where you might catch them every now and then. I feel like yes. at this point you can go out and just target them. And, and yes, you actually them. can. Yes. Uh, we, uh, that buddy has river rocker. We went up the river and there was just one deep pool that was, uh, I'm going to say 15 feet and we had live scope and it was just, I mean, it was a nice school. What we thought were bass were walleye. Man, really? They were nice size. Yeah, they were nice size ones. There was quite a few in that school. We could have sat there that day and just started catching them. What's the biggest that you've caught? Uh, walleye, probably four pounds. Wow. Yeah, I. Uh, that's that. I've only ever caught like four, maybe in my life. Only but, four, really? Yeah, well, I never fished for them. And, oh, okay. and catch your nose was by accident. It wasn't uh, intentional, you know. Uh, but, you know, they eat basically the same thing as a bass. I, I caught them on uh, different type of lures, crankbaits, uh, swim, swim baits, stuff like that. The last thing that I, I really want to talk about today is a place that I don't think a lot of people know about. It's a place on the river that you can put a big boat, which is Egypt Bend. And, yes. And because I don't have a little bit of knowledge of it at all. I can't really set it up. So I'll just say, what the heck is Egypt Bend? Egypt Bend, you know, uh, I've been fishing it for 40 years, uh, this daddy. And uh, it, uh, you know, it's it's got everything. It's got musky. That I've never caught a walleye there, but it's got musky, you know, uh, bass, bluegill, uh, and... Uh, Smallmouth, largemouth, catfish, it's it's suckers. It's got everything, you know. It's it. The section is about almost two miles long, maybe. And uh, it's I think the deepest there's there's one the the channel runs to the right on down to the dam, and there's one spot down there I think maybe eighteen feet, but wow. for the most part, you know, the most part it's like anywhere from one to, to 12 feet, something like that, you know? And it's basically kind of, is it shaped pretty much like Riverton or? It's uh, uh, almost uh, exactly like Riverton. The one thing about Riverton that's different than Egypt Bend, Egypt Bend has grass. Riverton, uh -huh. yes, a ton of grass. Now, the last few years, it's gotten really, really good. Uh, but, Riverton has no grass. Riverton's just like a big rock, you know, just rock ledges you know, and big rock all the way from the, the ripples down to the dam. Whereas Egypt Bend, from the ripples down to where, where you put in the ramp is, is rock. And then when you start going down, the ledges are, once you start around the bend towards the dam, then you start getting a little bit of mud because of the way the current rolls around that turn. You start getting mud on the right, and then your left has more of the rock. And then on Egypt Bend, there's there's the old river channel. I don't know how many people even know it's there, but it's off the bank about 50 yards, and it goes down a long ways, and it's in like 11, 12 feet of water. And it's a nice river channel around there. Does the grass actually support a healthy largemouth population? Yes. Uh, 
since the grasses came back, and when it gets really, really thick, those large mouth, they'll get, and even some of the small mouth will get in there, you know, because it's still got a little current on it. And uh, they'll get in there and just set. You could go down there, down close to the dam, you could flip, flip that grass and catch some nice large mouth. Wow, that is really and, cool. And you can use frogs and stuff on it, too. Huh. Yeah, I didn't that. know that. You know, the one thing I noticed this year was I went to Shenandoah, I fished a tournament over there. And the grass over there is even thicker than New Japan. It's so thick over there that, and, and there's a lot of current over uh, at that dam at Chamdoa. I didn't realize how much current actually flows through there, but it, it's a lot of current. And, and there's some pretty good sized bass over there. That's that really cool. A lot of grass, yeah. For people to know. And then again, you can launch your big boat out of there. It's on the South Fork, Egypt Bend. Um, so that, that's a really cool, just a little hidden gem that I don't think a lot of people know about outside this area. Um, do you have anything coming up on your schedule tournament wise? Are you fishing any tournament circuits right now? Uh, I've been, I just fished this, uh, local club, or well, a club tournament. They, they, they just fished the Shando river. Uh, I have not, I kind of got it. I was fishing big time tournaments here years ago and, and I kind of got out of it because number one, family, number two, money. Because if you want to compete big tournaments, you, you've got to have a little jack, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I just, every now and then, if I see a tournament, I'll jump in it, you know. And for the most part, you're just fishing, taking people out. That's it. But uh, I don't mind a little competition every now and then. Now, it, it's fun just to scratch that itch. And you're right, though. It's just cutting. Dude, it's so expensive. Oh, was, it is. I was looking at if I if I wanted to replace my boat someday because my boat's like twenty two years old. I know this boat's not going to last the rest of my life. I'll have to get another one, and I'm scared to death of that day when I have to get another one because it's know, it's it's a mortgage payment on a house. It's just I it's know. insane. Who who I I just want to know who the guys are that can afford like a thousand dollar boat payment. <laughs> Dude. You know, I got my Express. I ordered it new. I had a twenty twelve. Uh, 721 phoenix with the 250 on it and uh it was a great boat fast boat fully loaded but i mean jesus you get like two and a half miles at a gallon oh god you know? yeah it's just yeah and you got a 50 deal. gallon tank you, you it don't take long you can burn that stuff up quick oh dude now, this sick. express i got i ordered it new and uh, of course it only has an 18 gallon tank on it and the 115 but my god i can run for days on a tank of gas which i kind of like hey, have you ever thought about converting i guess can you still get a conversion kit jet conversion kit for a motor like that if you wanted to uh you know i don't know if yamaha i, I don't know if yamaha makes them not but yeah you can you uh like uh, the mercury steel they have the the bottom for them yeah uh I don't know. I guess you can't with the Yamaha. You could. But, how does the know, Express? Oh, continue. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say, like, how does that Express run? Like, I've never ridden in one. What do you well, think of it? Actually, you know, uh, it's pretty. I mean, I'm come out of a boat that I was doing seventy five. Now this boat here is nowhere near that. But you know, I was impressed the fact that it it will it will run like fifty, fifty to fifty three totally empty just me wow. uh but like with two people i'm running 48 50 all the time and full load but exactly. it, it it it's got that uh pad haul on it so it's built for speed and i've had it on the potomac and and dry dry ride you know it had to be pretty rough to get wet but i mean it it runs great you know i mean it's aluminum but uh it 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 really runs good now it's that's not as stable because you know it is aluminum and wind blows it around but i got power poles and all that so it's not a big deal well and you're coming from a phoenix which rumor has it i don't know if this is true or not the phoenix is probably one of the best riding fiberglass boats there absolutely is. hands down i could run the potomac and that thing could have two footers and i could run that thing just let her eat that's insane uh, yeah, my boat, not so much. I mean, it, it will definitely fly out of the water, no problem. But yeah, it, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a little rougher ride by what, far. What do you think of the Yamaha? You know, I, in 19, uh, in the 1980s, late 80s, I had a Yamaha two-stroke 
uh, on a uh, fiberglass bass tracker, believe it or not. One of the, uh, I've never seen a bass tracker that was fiberglass except for that one. But uh, oh, it had avalanche? The, the tracker, uh, Aval- I think it was called the tracker avalanche. I think is what. No, no, it was before that. Really? Yes. The, the avalanche was aluminum, right? I think so. actually, I think you're right. Yeah, it was yeah. a weird aluminum boat. Yeah. Uh, the the bass tracker, this was a fiberglass, seventeen foot, and it had a one hundred and fifty Yamaha two stroke, and that thing ran good. And I never, I've always had Mercury's after that, and this is the first Yamaha show I've ever had. I absolutely love it. That thing is quiet, and you could talk while you're running wide open. Yeah, that that is one thing. <sighs> I do really want about the four stroke is not about like the oil changing and all that. It's just so that it's quiet. So you can oh, have a conversation. Yeah. In the car. <laughs> you don't even know it's running. If you're sitting idling, you can't tell it's running. That's insane. Yeah. It's, it's just so quiet. It's unreal. <sighs> okay. Well then I know like on the to-do list is trying to upgrade something like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I ordered my boat new and it was, I think it was during the pandemic. And uh, they, it listed with nothing on it was like 27. And by the time I got done with all the options, you know, I'm, I was like 45. But uh, it's fully loaded. Now, now the same boat is like 30, 36, 37,000 with nothing on it. Mm-hmm. Lunar went through the roof. Dude, but, everything's yeah. gone through the roof. It, it's yeah. it's insane. I mean, I, I don't know. It's It's people ask me like, you know, why I don't fish a lot of big tournaments anymore. And it's just, first, I put most of my extra money back into the podcast right now. But second, it's like, it's a, it's a lot, it's an expensive hobby to say it I'm going to fish it all is. the DFLs or all the coasts right now. And it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know, and, and with all the, uh, the, the technology out there, if you're going, I mean, even the best fishermen, and I know these guys say, oh, I don't make no difference with the live scope, still got to catch them. Yeah, you do. And that's very much true. But if you've got any experience fishing and you, you know, reacting to watching a fish's reaction is everything. Cause I can tell you, I could, if I see a fish, I could tell you in like five minutes, whether I can catch it or not. And that live scope, it makes a difference. You know, like my buddy's got it on his boat. We can sit there and watch those fish's reaction to top water lures. I mean, you could watch it come up and look at it and you stop, you know, watch the reaction and, and even, even like jerk baits and stuff like that. Uh, the only thing where I think it would be a little different is like if they're feeding off the bottom. That would Yeah. It, it, it just cuts down your time. Like big time. Uh, I finally got, um, I got it installed on my boat this year. And I know when I was practicing and fishing a little bit, it's that you can look at an area, a point, an example, before you probably take 10 extra minutes fishing that right point. now right. you wave across and you're like there's nothing here move on and so now all of a sudden i mean i, I you could easily save two to three hours a day that you're saving on an eight oh, hour yeah, day absolutely you know places that you went before you thought were fish now you know either they're there or they're not you see them mm-hmm. You know, and then it's just a matter of whether you catch them or not. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's what's so important. Now you're spending the time in the areas that have yes. them. Um, and that's its power. I mean, everyone's like, well, you can watch them hook. Yeah, but they don't always play that way where you watch no. them take your bait. But you know, you eliminate areas of the lake. Yes, so much you at least know they're there. You're yes. going to spend enough time on those fish to know whether you can catch them or not, and then you're gone. Doesn't yes. Matter. Yes. Beforehand, I've now I've thought about this too. Uh, how many times did I fish an area that truly sucked, but I just didn't know it. Right. And now right. I, I just know, boop, boop, nope, they're not here. Move on. And that right. to me is just like, that blew my mind when you think of it in that context. Well, and, and you know what they always say, the more lines you got in the water or the more you cast, the more chance you catch a fish. Well, if you know they're not there, then you're not going to waste your time where now before we would waste our time in a, in a spot, never knowing they were mm-hmm. there. And now it's just, it's just saving a ton of time. An absolute ton of time, sir. You know, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Again, absolutely. one more time for the people at home. Uh, if, if, if they want to get in contact with you and your guide service, how can they get a hold of you? Just uh, 
contact uh, Brothers Fishing Service on Facebook, or you can you can contact me at five four zero six six zero zero one five five. And you know, and I'm all I've got people that text me all the time if they got questions or anything. And I I you know if you got a question, you can text me, call me. I'll be happy to answer any questions you got about fishing, uh, and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, you know, I just want everybody to go out and have fun and catch fish. That's what it's all about. You're a legend. And then again, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today so that you'll be able to find him. Facebook, email, phone number, everything will be there. If you guys want any other questions answered, you know, feel free to reach out to me at fishingdmv at gmail.com. If you want to come on the show or if you have any questions, you know, we might be talking here, but we're done. Please subscribe and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.